Hey, everybody. How you guys doing? Howdy, howdy, howdy. We're good. You're not on your couch tonight, Sam. No, Laura has a board meeting, so I got sent to the office. So oh. I'll be hanging out here. <laughs> Sam, Marsha, how you guys doing? We're that was a great, good. great Saturday. Thank you very much. I yes. really enjoyed being able to relax like that. Thank you. We, we did too. <laughs> There's Mr. Bro. Jeremy's already started on a smelling. You guys can, there's two bottles yeah, tonight. You can go ahead and pour out bottle number one and uh, get started on your sniffing. Is there, isn't there three, three bottles? Three. three that I got. Yeah, I'm checking the date to make sure I pulled the right day out. Yeah, I got <laughs> I three. Know, same here. <laughs> we have three bottles. Can you do it? The other one was that one? Oh, well, I need to get another Glen Karen. <laughs> All right, but we're safe to open them. That's what you're saying. Yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> Did you not hear that part? After too many false starts before, right? Or going in back, going in reverse order and things like that. It's like I, I get cautious to open it now. <laughs> it was 3.2 no. and uh, yeah. So every bottle or every, all of your sample bottles that have the date May 17th, go ahead and open them. Yeah. <laughs> Whether it be seven or whether whether it's one or whether it's like twenty. Are there are there one, two, or three? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there were three. There's three. Here's three. Your There's three. three. Told you. Three. Yeah. And I have three bottles here, so I don't know why the problem in my brain. That's just um, hard late in the day. Yeah. Um we got a couple minutes still here. Um, we're going to go ahead and throw up the flavor wheel. And um, we're going to jump right in like we typically do and look at the, uh, look at these. So start with bottle one. And I'm going to, I'm going to let some of you guys really walk through this with us because we've done this now quite a bit and you guys know the process, you know, what we're looking for. Um, so Let's start with bottle one. What do you guys think? Color, legs. I get it. It's got beautiful legs, oily. I get a lot of dill. Yep. I was thinking sourdough, not dill. I, just, I get a lot of baking spices, a little, little oak and, and vanilla. At first, I, I thought it. I thought it smelled like a lot of like a like a single malt barley, but it's opened and you get like notes of corn and, and corn silk through it a little bit to me. Getting some mint smell even now out of it. Yeah, that dill and mint kind of go together. I think yep. you guys are blending a, a flavor there. Um, so when we're looking on the flavor wheel, woods. Are we picking up any wood fl um, flavors on the nose at all? Oh man. And the answer can be no. Just, I mean, I, I don't think, I mean, I think the other stuff takes it over if there is, there probably is wood there, but. Let me throw a flavor out there that I'm picking. Fine. Up. Buttered toast. Yeah, like a, like a, like a citrus. It, citrus, like a great, it's like a great pear. It's, it's, hmm. I can, I, I can see a little bit of that pine too. All right, let's go ahead and have some sips. Wow. That pine just came out and punched me in the throat. Yep. <sighs> They're very punchy. Um, you had mentioned maybe a rye, maybe some sweetness of a corn. Zach, you're, you're not in your head. What do you think, bud? I'm going four gray. I think I know who it is. They just recently moved. <laughs> <laughs> but so there's go, three. There are three. So who said a four grain? I did, Bruce. Bruce, Bruce yeah. I because smell. like Jeremy at the beginning, I wanted to say malt, but then I just pulled back going, no, that's not, it's not really a barley, but I, I keep jumping around. I get rye, barley, and corn. 
Malt doesn't necessarily mean barley. There's malted rye out there. Well, true, true. There's malted wheats. There's there's other malts out there. That's right. You don't even have barley on your wheel, so it's not even an option. <laughs> well, remember these are flavor notes, so you're not necessarily. <laughs> oh, not actually. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I mean, yeah, the nose have... changes constantly. Yeah, yeah. Um, proof? You guys picking up anything on the proof? I think it's barrel strength. Seems a little stronger. I'm not sure how high, but yeah, it's not your regular low end stuff. Mm -hmm. 115. 110. Oh, wow. Okay. 112 and a half. <laughs> 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 Wait, what was his guess? 112.6. Um, yeah. Damn, what's the price? If you go over, you're wrong, so I'm just going to say one. One. The, um, the price is, right. is right. <laughs> the price is right. Um, Sam and Marsha, I want to I want to pick on you for half a minute on this one. You know, Marsha, you've got quite the flavor palette. What what are you picking up? And And go ahead. Well, I learned a lot about malt, and I'm tasting that it's a that heavy yeasty taste, which I think I see as malt, maybe. So that yeasty, it's just it, I don't know. That's what I'm tasting is a heavy, heavy yeast. The bread rising and getting to that point where it's like mm, yum. Remember, we talked about where the flavor hits on your tongue. Um, do you pick anything up off of that? Toward the back, toward the back. And what did toward the back mean? High rye, high rye. Sam? That's what <laughs> I was telling her. I, I pick up rye on the back end. and But the front end, my the tip of my tongue also burns. So I don't know if that's proof <laughs> or, you know, I'm guessing it's, it's a high proof. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lay, what do you think? We getting close with you? I would have said uh, roughly the same. I'm getting a lot of the rye on the back end. Uh, then uh, the uh, proof wise, I, I would say it's definitely a higher proof, but uh, as I would have guessed that maybe a malted rye or a rye. Okay. Um, do you guys have second glasses? We can jump to um, the second bottle. Yes. Hmm. If not, chug the one you got. Booker, Brooker, I mean, I was joking, buddy. <laughs> he, he just boom, downed it. <laughs> Way to go. I'm sorry. It was actually really good. I really enjoyed that one. The first one. <laughs> it's all, all right, good, bud. All right, James, you gotta you gotta send Brooker some extra Glengarens or something. You <laughs> I, know? I do, yeah. I agree. Um, oh wow. Uh, this one's totally different. Totally okay. different. On the nose? There's, there's no heat on the nose at all. No. Okay. A lot of sweetness. Butter, a, lot of wine. a wine cask. Okay. Hmm. A wine cask. Oh, I, I do. Yeah, the buttery. I definitely get the buttery you're talking about. Yeah. I, I get that on the afterwards that it, it's like some type of a, a, a finishing cask. Okay. That smells good. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful. Much lower proof. Much lower proof. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I'd agree. Lower proof for sure. Like 90. Still has some of that bite on the back of the tongue, though, on the tasting, though. Just a little bit? Just a little. Tiny. Not big, but. Sure. If you talk about front, middle, back type of thing. Yeah, that, that corn really comes through in the follow on the finish there. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely corn coming on this. Bruce, I see you adding a little bit of water to yours. At the very, when I just have a bit left, I'm playing with that on each of them. The first one, it really brought out corn to me afterwards and more of that bread. You, you can taste like the husk almost. It's on, on number two. On number two. Mm. So the first one, I was hearing more, you guys are heading towards uh, malted rye or, or something in the malted rye with a blend of maybe corn or something. Um, 
where are you guys going with this one? This might just be a straight corn whiskey. Okay. Jeff? Straight. I'm going with – I'm going to have to go with the, the Nancy the Nose. I think it's <laughs> corn. I'm, yeah, definitely corn. Okay. This one is complex. I will, I will tell you guys, there's a lot going on with the flavors on this between what's on your nose, what's on yeah. the palate, and the finish. There's, it's very complex. There's a lot going on here. Is um, it a mix of several? You really think I'm going to tell you the answer? <laughs> <laughs> the nose has heat, and then the finish doesn't. It's, this one's it's got like a floral. Damn. It's pleasant. This is one yeah. of those that you really can just sit around. And because it's not a high proof, I really think it's one of those. It, it doesn't drink like a high proof. It's one of those you could sit down on a nice summer evening and drink. And, and it's not so heavy that it's really, you know, in my opinion. 95 proof. All right. 95. All right. Uh, what about the boys? Garrett, Mark, what what'd you guys think? Uh, my first thought on the second was actually smoke. So, but yeah, it's definitely corn in there. Uh, so I think it might be a little smoked something. The first one, yeah, uh, it's it's a. I, I think you're right with the malted rye. I have, yeah. I, have, I have an idea who this might be, but I'm not going to say. Okay. Well, I think what we're going to do is instead of jumping to bottle three because that's there's a lot going on with their flavors and palates and, and everything here. Um, let's jump into introducing who the distillery is and then we can talk about that. And then bottle three, we can taste with them. What do you guys think? Works for me. All right. So there's a couple of you guys who think you know who this is. Zach. Tawakaro. Tawakaro. You're yeah. absolutely right, bud. Good job. <laughs> and joining us, our Phyllis Barrel tonight is Shannon Hood. Shannon, how you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> Excellent. Shannon, how close were we? What was bottle one? Y'all were very close. So your first one was our uh, malted rye whiskey, uh, 105 proof. Um, and it is kind of technically a four grain. So 67% malted rye, 17% raw rye grain. And then 6% corn, 6% wheat. Good math. <laughs> yeah. So you, you guys were right. You know, Sam and Marsha, that's why I was kind of poking on you because we did the ride just the other day. Um, so now you can see how those flavors and what we did, how that translates to picking up this bottle and, and tasting through it. Um, You're such a good teacher. <laughs> Good students and when anyone's pouring liquor it's always good um so let's talk quickly about bottle number two what was bottle number two bottle number two was our four grain bourbon 96 proof so i heard somebody say 95 so you were really close um this is also a, our four grain bourbon so 65 percent corn so yes a lot of sweetness from the corn 11% wheat, 11% rye, 13% malted barley. So we're a little higher on the malted barley content than, than most bourbons are. Um, one thing that, uh, and, and before we go much further, I do want to give Shannon the opportunity to introduce herself and introduce Tawakaro. So just like we've done when we've had our guests on here, um, who is Shannon? It's another girl. Like we said, what the hell do girls know about whiskey, right? Um, <laughs> Shannon, go ahead, please. Give us your bio because it's extraordinary. So, yes. Yeah, so, I'm Shannon Hood. I am the chief whiskey enthusiast for Tawakero Distillery. Um, at the distillery, I wear many hats. You will see me doing events like this. You will see me out in the market at bars, restaurants, liquor stores. I lead tastings, um, I do the tours, I also help distill. Um, so at the distillery, I wear many hats. Um, outside of Tawakero, I'm the president of East Texas Bourbon Society. Um, 
I've also recently come back from Kentucky. I am now certified as an executive bourbon steward. Um, and uh, I leave the North Texas chapter of bourbon women. So if it has anything to do with bourbon or whiskey, I'm involved somehow. <laughs> and um, for those guys who remember our, uh, our Westward Whiskey and our Barrel Select we did with Westward Whiskey. Shannon um, was part of that tasting with us and the East Texas Bourbon Society is going in with us on that barrel selection. And so you have to fight with them to get your bottles um, uh, along with, with uh, our stuff. Um, Tawakero, tell us a little bit about Tawakero because that's, that's a heck of a name. Um, what's that about? <laughs> so Tawakero, Tawakero was started in 2016 by two brothers, Justin and Jason Jackson. We uh, started in Grapevine, Texas. Um, started 2016, first product actually hit the shelves the very beginning of 2019. Um, Tawakero, the name itself is actually a Caddo Indian word. It means bend in the river. Um, and in Grapevine, not far from the distillery is a creek. Um, it's called Tawakero Creek. Um, and in 1843, Sam Houston met several leaders of many of the indigenous tribes at an oak tree on that creek and signed the treat, uh, peace treaty. Um, it was started signing there. It, the finishing signatures were put on at Bird's Fort, so it became the Treaty of Bird's Fort. Um, it stabilized North Texas. Um, two years later, we were a state. Um, and it's also sort of a philosophy. Uh, we're always looking for that next adventure, what's around that next bend in the river. Um, December, this past December, we actually packed up that distillery and moved east to Palestine, Texas. Um, we are finishing some construction, um, hoping to be open midsummer. Tasting room tours, our, our new stills are in place. Um, they have an exciting history. Um, we are part of the Texas Whiskey Trail, so can't wait to have everybody out and let you see what we're doing. Um, go ahead. Sorry, did I miss that, Shannon, that you're moving to Palestine? Yes, we already have moved. We uh, packed up December is when the move happened. Um, we purchased, it's sitting on eight and a half acres. It's an old Coors distribution center. So we were completely out of barrel storage space in Grapevine. Um, this has two huge existing warehouses on it. So we've got plenty of, of room for growth. Best use of a course facility I've ever heard of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Palestine's kind of a, uh, a random spot to uh, do this on the map and go like there, coming from Grapevine. Sean's yeah. Um, I'm, I'm from East Texas. I, I live in East Texas. Um, the two owners uh, have loved East Texas. Actually, East Texas, um, through East Texas Bourbon Society, was the first retail market that Tawakero was uh, released in. Um, East Texas has always been very good to Tawakero. Um, and, and both of the brothers were looking for uh, land, property, so they could hunt and fish. And East Texas was a great fit for them. Um, also, the cost of property in Palestine is a fraction of the cost in what we were looking for in the D in the Metroplex area. And you could have off-premise liquor sales. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, real quick, tell us about the bottle design, because this is one of the most unique bottles that... Yeah. Uh, in, so in looking back kind of on the, 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 you know, the 1843, 1845, the bottle, the bottle shape is actually designed to be like an, an old canteen. Um, they joke, um, and I've been called out for making puns, Toa Caro, our, our flavor profile, we're looking for a, a well-rounded um, 
tasting whiskey that hits the, the rounded bottle. But it, it is designed to be uh, like an old canteen shape. You know, I, as you guys can tell, I mean, I've killed my samples. Um, <laughs> thankfully, I have bottles. Um, this is fantastic. And one of the things that I, I think I really love about it is, is kind of what you guys are talking about, especially when we did the, uh, the four grain, sorry, the four grain um, bourbon. It's beautiful. It's pretty. Um, you don't really say that about whiskeys a lot, but, you know, I think someone had said they, they thought it was a finished bottle, that it was, you know, maybe finished in a, in a, in a barrel, but it's not. Um, is that from the malting? Where do you think those, those finished flavors come from? Um, it, it could be that high percentage of, of malted barley. Um, and, and I heard somebody comment that it was very complex. I mean, it is four grain. You know, you get the sweetness from the corn, the, the softness of the wheat gives it that sort of buttery, creamier mouthfeel, a little bit of spiciness from the rye, and then that malted barley is going to kind of round it out. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was one for the complex, but I, I think that, you know, we heard people pulling out the different grains and not having had a four grain yet as part of our tasting samples and not many four grains exist out there. It does kind of throw you for a loop when you're expecting, oh, there's sweetness, there's corn, wait, but there's something else. So maybe it's not a bourbon, but wait, wait, there's something else over here. <laughs> um, but I think that those flavors blended so well together in this that even at, at the proof that it is at 95 proof, it doesn't drink like a 95 proof. To me, this drink's much, much lower, especially with um, over ice. You put, it, put, a, put a rock in this and it completely changes it. It does open up more flavors that you don't get out of the bottle. Um, but out of the bottle, it's, it's beautiful. Where's the price point on this? So the four grain bourbon is sitting generally right at 49 to 53. Um, and then the rye malt is going to be about $10 more. So at the distillery, we would sell it for $49 and $59. Um, you guys ready to go for bottle number three? I don't care. I have to tell you, we're so sad. We do not have bottle number three, but we will guess what it is. You don't have bottle three? It's but okay. That's okay. Before you, before you do that, though, I have a question. Um, looking at the mash bill for the rye, what is rye berry? It is just the raw rye grain. It is tr what traditional rye whiskey is made from. And then rye malt? It's just the rye grain, which has been malted. Um. So everyone except for sampling three, right? Yes. Yep. Wow. I got I got to learn more about that. Yeah. Is do y'all use TX malt? Yes, we do. So our corn is coming from we use predominantly uh -huh. Texas grains. Uh, our corn is coming from our corn and our wheat are coming from farms in Denton County up near Crum. Uh, our rye is coming from farms just south of Amarillo, and our malt is coming from Tex Malt in Fort Worth. So what are you guys getting on this? I mean, we know who it is, but you don't know what it is. So let's still kind of go through well, that. What's that? If we opened our envelope, now we know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. The reason I said it couldn't be Tower Care to begin with because we had three bottles and I only knew they did two spirits, but I know, yeah, it, it, it This one tastes like a, uh, like a port barrel finish, kind of has a, some sort of, to me, it tastes a little bit sweeter. But if anyone did, you know, curious to see if anyone else pulled anything different out of it, like Kyle. If not, That's you know, weird. Okay. Wait, was I talking? No. Yeah, to me, it's, a, it's got a port time. barrel finish. Uh, yeah, okay, it is Ramon. Um, That's my bad. What about uh, on the on on the palate? But more importantly, what are you picking up on the strength? Higher proof, cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Shannon, you want to tell us what we're drinking? 
So y'all are drinking uh, the four grain bourbon again, but at cask strength. And we go into the barrel at 125. So when we do a cast string, it can be anywhere from 125, I've seen it up to 132 proof. And we, last year we had the 132 proof. In fact, I think Jason went and he actually just poured it right out of the barrel for us. And uh, um, it's fantastic. This to me, what I love about this is it's the same bourbon that we had on bottle number two. It's just cask strength. So look at how much just that little bit of proof made in the difference in the flavors and what flavors came out of the bottle compared to at a proofed down level. Um, now, Sam and Marsha, you will get a sample of this. I apologize. I'm not sure what happened. I'm going to blame our assistant who uh, helped bottle these things. Um, okay, Sam drank it, didn't kept it to himself. <laughs> you know what, Are Sam you saying Eleanor? Eleanor had a hand in this. Yeah, it was El absolutely. Aww. Ellie, um, would, Ellie, Ellie wouldn't jip you. Um, <laughs> what What do you guys think of the cask strength versus the barrel? I actually really like the cask strength better. It brought out more sweetness. Um, it 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 hit me at first, but it was like a good thing, and I was like, "Oh, what is this?" And went back at it, and it was it was great. That's why I thought it had some sort of port barrel finish to it. It's it sweeter. I, I freaking I, I love it way better. I shouldn't say way better because that kind of sounds like I hate it too. <laughs> but the three was is definitely um, more pleasant than than two for me. Um, what was the proof on number two and number three again? Number two would number be three is one twenty five and number two ninety five. Ninety five. Yeah. Yeah, that cast is where it's at. I love our cast strength. Even mm -hmm. if you get um, a barrel that's one twenty seven, one twenty eight proof, or one thirty plus, they don't drink that way. Um, they drink much smoother um, than than the proof that they are. And, and instead of it coming out as heat from the proof, it is more of those baking spices and the cinnamon and, and those spices are highlighted mm -hmm. as opposed to it being that that proof bite that you get. Um, I, I love that about it. We've heard, you know, a lot of people now talking about it tasted like a finished barrel. We haven't talked about your barrels yet. Um, and, you, you know, let's talk about the char level you guys use and the cooperage you use, because that does affect what is absolutely in, in this. We are, we started off using barrels from Barrel 53 Cooperage. Um, about a year and a half ago, we switched. Um, we were having too many leakage issues. So we are now using Kelvin Cooperage. Um, and we use two different sizes. We do use 30 gallon and 53 gallon barrels. Uh, we are a char number four. Um, Again, like I said, we are going into the barrel at that maximum of 125 proof. Um, we are uh, a pot still. We are not a column still. We are a, a pot still. Um, so that kind of adds a little bit more characteristic to the flavor of the bourbon, I think. Yeah, and in fact, on the on the blind taste, we heard someone call out the oils that were in this. You, you guys don't. You guys have a, a fairly radical line arm angle, which helps introduce more of those oils to it. Um, uh, Vendome is your still well, manager, right? Um, actually, um, what the still we had in Grapevine was a Corson pot still. Um, the new kettles that we have um, are two 400 gallon kettles that Vendome redid for us. Um, they were, their, their previous life was they were milk condensers in a Hershey chocolate factory. Um, and now they will be making whiskey. <laughs> Best of both worlds. Repurpose a course location and repurpose <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, go bourbon. You guys, so so one of your the one of the brothers actually has a history in distilling, right? Yes. So Jason, the older brother, 
actually uh, owns another distillery in Colorado Springs, Axe in the Oak. Um, they opened in 2013, um, and the younger brother was living here in Texas, Justin, um, and it was 2016 that he lured Jason and his family down to Texas so they could start Tolacaro. So there's some, some actual history and knowledge that came forward with them. Um, now, I know you guys just did a big move. Um, you've got three fantastic products. Now, one is basically the same. It's just a cask strength. With the rye, is there any looking at going to uh, maybe cask strength on the rye as well? Um, we have, I have approached a few people in doing a barrel pick for, um, a cast strength rye. Um, up until now, uh, the only way to actually get the cast strength bourbon was for a store or club to do a barrel pick. But now we are, uh, with favorite brands, they have actually brought on, um, the cast strength bourbon. So you will see all three products on a shelf, regardless of if the store has done a, a, a bourbon barrel pick or not. Um, we do have some experiments aging at the distillery. We have a straight rye whiskey. Um, we've got an, a few barrels of an experimental red and blue corn. Um, I have a, a corn whiskey aging in a used bourbon barrel. And then we've got some rye malts aging in used bourbon barrels, bourbon aging in used rye barrels. So there are a few experiments at the distillery. Those will more than likely be distillery only releases. What, you know, you know we've, we've talked about some dates and some aging here. How long are you guys aging this? Because you do have two different size casks. Yes. So the bourbon that is in the bottle now is two and a half to three years old. The rye malt is a year and a half to two years old. Are they both aged in the two different sizes or is one for the 30 and one for rye the... Rye malt is traditionally in the smaller, in the 30 gallon. Um, we're really liking, we have uh, a couple of three-year-old 53 gallon bourbons. We're really liking the flavor that's coming off of the older 53 gallon barrels. Um, obviously your smaller barrels are going to age a little quicker um, and you don't want to leave them in there too long because then you get uh, over oaked kind of flavor. Right. Um, but we're, we're starting to switch more towards just the larger barrels for the bourbon. Here's, here's a question that I've that I'm curious about and you know, being in Grapevine in, in, you know, right in the middle between DFW, um, that location and the temperature there and the temperature variances there versus going out to Palestine, there's some temperature variations. There's a terroir difference between the two locations. How do you project and expect that to affect the flavor out of the barrels? And do you? Um, that will be something that we get to see. Um, temperature difference, it, you're going to have a little bit more humidity here in East Texas, but not quite like the humidity you're going to have towards the Gulf Coast region. Sure. Um, it still gets hot here in East Texas, just like it does in, in the Metroplex area. Um, so I'm really not expecting it to be too much of a difference but that's just kind of something time will tell as yeah, I, barrels I, continue to age. I know that, that down here in the Austin metro area, we're talking to some of the distilleries down here and they move their rick houses out into the farmland to get out of the urban environment and some of that exposure it has to the urban air. And you guys have done the same thing where you've now moved your rick house and the distilling process from a very industrialized area of DFW out to an eight acre country facility. So I imagine. There's going to be some yeah. <laughs> well, cause the urban area can be somewhat insulating also. So if you get the extreme cold, then you're going to continue to have that extreme cold. You're not going to have the fluctuation as, as much as if you get out into the, the 
outer regions of the Metroplex. We do have a question, and do you know the approximate price point on the cast strength? It is at the 59. At, at the distillery, it would be 59. Your retail stores, you're probably going to see it up low 60s, 63 that's, to 65. That's not a huge price swing from the standard price of the regular bourbon. That's that's very reasonable. That's, I like that. Um, very reasonable people. They are very reasonable people. They're great people. If you have the opportunity, which we have done. A... They're from San Angelo. <laughs> Do you know these people? Um, <laughs> we uh, we actually did a, a group tours, Probes Guild. We went up there last, well, before COVID hit and did a tour up there uh, through North Texas. But we spent uh, quite a bit of time up there at the distillery. Um, fantastic people. And Karis and I have been up there when we did our pick, or not our pick, but we got the bottles for last year's event like this um and spending time with them up there was just amazing um they had never met us before but but they opened up the doors and welcomed us in like you know we we're best friends um they've known us forever um you know we've, we've done a lot with and no offense we've done a lot with the small distilleries and i say that compared to you know the garrison brothers and the bacones and the big names that are out there Tawakero is is not one of the bigger names yet and, and, you know, like I said, East Texas has definitely been out there. Um, in the Austin metro area, uh, we, we looked at this just before we came online. Some of the places you guys can pick this up, Moondance. You've heard us talk about Moondance all the time. I know some of you guys have been there to pick up product. Deb's Liquor, if you're over towards the Cedar Park area, um, Ramon, Deb's Liquor has this over off of 183 and um, right there at Lake Line area. Um, plus some of the bigger stores, the, the big name brands have this. Total Wine, Specs. Um, I know there's one in Austin called Old School. Uh, if you're out towards Buda, there's uh, Proof Liquor in Delhi. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting out there. And you're in South Austin quite a bit at some of the liquor stores down there doing tastings. I've noticed that over the, the summer and the fall. Yes. <laughs> um, so here's a, here's a question that Jeremy has, and I think it's a great question. Um, how big are your batches when, you're out, when you guys are bottling, and how hard is it to maintain consistency during that batching process? So if you see the batch numbers on the bottle, a batch is every thousand bottles. Um, I batch we, eight and batch two. Of the batch time. eight, yes. Um, I think we recently were about to be on batch nine of the bourbon. Um, and I want to say the last bottling of rye we did was batch three. If you ever find batch one of the rye malt, my absolute favorite. Um, we actually used a German malted rye in batch one. Uh, batch two, we used a, a, a Texas rye, but for the malted rye, we have gone back to that that German uh, malted rye. And I will I will tell you guys this: if you ever come over for Fireside Friday, I have batch one cask strength of the malted rye. Um, that, and I don't think there that was never released. That it was, was never something. released. No, no. We, we are, are hoarding that barrel at the distillery. And um, on Fridays, it's called Full Throttle Friday. We taste through barrels just to see how they're doing. And we always end up tasting that uh, first barrel of the malted rye. And we lament on how low the barrel level is getting. <laughs> It was it was an honor when um, and and they kind of argued a little bit over ah, I'm not going to give that to him ah, right. and Jason just went over there and he literally put a funnel rolled the barrel and just filled the filled the bottles it was it was great um, no cheesecloth or anything angel poop the whole nine yards it is fantastic and it's one of those bottles that if you guys have been here on my fireside Fridays it's in the cabinet. It's not out on the bar top. It's in the cabinet because it is just one of those absolutely phenomenal. Sam, I see you chuckling. You, you know what that means to me to have it, you know, in the, in the cabinet. Um, it's fantastic. I am willing to share that um, with certain people. You might have to be a, 
um, a Patreon level member to get oh. to get access to that. Just so you know, is uh, that uh, is that the level where we get a polo shirt? Yes, it is actually. <laughs> no polos. <laughs> So oh, back to that question, when we are blending uh, barrels for the bourbon, we blend no more than three barrels together. And that's kind of um, how we keep that consistent is, you know, we're tasting through barrels all the time. When we find some barrels that are ready, we'll kind of on a smaller scale, blend some of those barrels together so that we're constantly getting that consistent flavor profile for the bourbon. How do you guys go about choosing the different varieties of uh, your, your grains? Because you went from, you went from the German, German. rye to Tex malt. Tex malt to back to the German rye. So yeah. how do you go about and deciding? That's just in the uh, rye malt whiskey. Um, in the four grain bourbon, you know, we want to use all Texas grain. Um, we use, where we're getting the grains from is in Denton. It's MBS seed. Um, and so they let us know what farms that those grains are coming from. Um, and in the beginning, they kind of played around with different varieties, different kinds of different varieties of corn from different places and and just kind of settled settled on those particular grains. I think one of the things that's that's very interesting your hang tag has it on here. Um, you guys won a World Whiskies Award. You got a bronze in the World Whiskies Award for that four grain bourbon. Yep. Uh, and then uh, we've won several different awards. Last year, uh, 2020, we won gold in the SIP awards for both the uh, rye malt and the cast strength bourbon. Those two. Yeah. These two. Um, and, and yeah, you've got, you've got a number of awards and, you know, for, for the smaller craft distilleries to go to these tastings or to these competitions and walk away with any award is actually a huge deal because they're up against the money. They're up against the big guys um, so for, for a small town craft distiller to go to these things and walk away with, with, you know, hardware, that's a big deal. And it really says something about the, the quality and the craftsmanship. And, the, you know, it's something we love about Texas. It, it's just that the distillers put their heart and their soul into it. And, you know, and what goes into that isn't what um, they're worried about is going to sell. It's what they love. It's, it's them in a bottle. Um, uh, oh, there's a good question. Um, did you move line 98 to Palestine or did you uh, dispose the, of the Corson still? Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, so it did get moved to Palestine. Um, that particular system, the other distillery, Axe in the Oak, is purchasing that. So that still will not be used in Palestine. That's a beautiful our, still, by the way. We have our uh, two new, um, I wish I could show you all a picture of our, <laughs> of our two new used to be chocolate making pots that are now uh, our, our pot stills, but um, they are just as beautiful, if not even more beautiful, but the, the old 98 will be put to good use up in Colorado Springs. Do you, you still will have, have to extra? Give us, you will just have to give us preferential dates when you guys have your grand opening. Yeah. Absolutely. Bruce? <laughs> Do y'all still have extra um, the chocolate heaters or did y'all sell them all? We do still have uh, two more. Okay. Um, yes. I know they're sold. Someone's going to buy them now. Um, <laughs> one. So we had a total of six, I believe. So two were sold, two we've had redone, and we still have two uh, that have not been redone. Um, we're not sure we're if we're going to sell them or if we're going to have Vendome redo those for us as well. 
you know, we just you just talked about something that I think went over a lot of people's heads. Can we maybe roll back a half a step and talk about what you're talking about? Because with a pot still, that is important. What? The heaters. The thickest copper you'll ever find. Yeah, no, he's talking about the um, the the kettles that we got from the Hershey factory. They were uh, made by a company uh, called Arthur Harris, who was like the still copper maker um, up until the mid '60s. Um, but yes, when Vendel and we got uh, got these stills to redo them for us. Um, they are, you can't even get copper this thick anymore. Um, these stills will never have to be redone um, because of how thick they are. Um, they're just a, a historic, historic pieces. I know that when we're talking about distilling and that heating process and keeping a consistent temperature inside of that boil while it's happening is important. And so that thickness of the copper really helps with that. Um, but there's also a lot of copper flavors that have to get stripped off with the oils and everything else. It's, I can't wait to give you guys a much deeper in-depth understanding of uh, distilling in the pot. I have a skin that process. That, that might do it. Nathan, I saw you holding up a bottle there. So you're familiar with, uh, with, with this brand. That's actually, yeah, you've got the cast strength there. Got the cast strength. Derek, Derek got that for me for my birthday. But yeah, Tawakaro was, uh, I did the tasting series last year and I'd never heard of Tawakaro last year and they were by far my favorite um, out of that. And the only sad thing was that there aren't a whole lot of bottles or weren't at least at that time available around here at any of the stores that I'd gone to. Um, that's, that's become a little better, but Palestine's also a lot more agreeable to me than DFW area <laughs> ever was. So um uh, I really look forward to going and seeing y'all when y'all are fully up and running this summer. Well, I will, I will tell you that um, Shannon is down here on a semi-regular basis, but um, you, we're, we're trying to work out some stuff that maybe we can have Tawakar down here where we can do some in-person tastings and, and do a little bit more with them. Yeah. Um, Shannon, one thing we haven't talked about with this product that we, we usually talk about with a lot of the other products is, is cocktails. We don't hear Tabacaro used a lot in cocktails. Um, what's your opinion on that? Um, I We have a full list of cocktails. I'd be happy to send you um, all our cocktails we have made up, and then you can share them with your group. Um, I love our, our rye malt in a cocktail. I love our rye malt in an old-fashioned, um, using some chocolate bitters. I think it pulls out, you know, the... Uh, the chocolatey butteriness from that rye malt that is already present on the palate. Um, I, I think it's beautiful in a cocktail. And yeah, I, I think, really love our cast strength in a cocktail as well. I, one of the things I wanted you guys to understand is when we talk about cocktails with these, think of the flavors that initially you guys were pulling out. You were pulling out, you know, that was light, it was easy, floral. You were picking up, this is finished, this is um, they're Aztec chocolate bitters that, that Marsha's holding up there. Um, you know, when you start doing those flavors and mixing them into a cocktail, a lot of times people are adding stuff to get those flavors out of it, but it's already in your, uh, in, in the base whiskey. Um, and I think a lot of people overlook that, that you don't have to do a lot to this in order to get it out, but you can make a cocktail with this and it's still going to be just, just beautiful. Um, I haven't had an old fashioned with this yet. And I know that's something a lot of us has been, been experimenting with. Um, you have an old fashioned recipe that goes with this. Yes, we do. There they are on your tasting cards. On, on the back you guys the have. Um, so I wanted, I wanted you guys to pull that out and, and understand that part of what goes into these swag kits are those cocktail cards. And we do want you to take time to actually go and, and try these cocktails. Um, go get a bottle of this. You're going to be pleasantly surprised with the cocktails from Tawakaro. Um, I, I, I've been absolutely loving it. Brooker, young man, come on up here to the bar. We will make a couple of these things. We'll show you how to make them. We will get you squared away. Um, by the way, Shannon, just so you know, and I always pick on, on young Brooker. Brooker turned 21. Well, now it's guess it's been six months. He turned 21 about six months ago. Um, yeah. But he did, he did approach us uh, right after he turned 21. I said, would you teach me how to drink? Would you teach me about spirits? 
Um, and this young man has been just a sponge soaking this stuff up. So, um, yeah, this has been like school to him. He has like a notepad and a pencil. <laughs> I've been writing everything down, saving all the drinks that I love, every single one of them. The first one we did, I loved that one. Oh, that was very good. <laughs> he even saw me down it, but I was like, I don't. It's still good, though. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, other questions. I've been monopolizing a lot of her time. Other questions for Shannon about Tawakara, about Bourbon women, about East Texas Bourbon? Uh, we didn't touch on the fact that she is. We only touched on the fact that she is. She leads the North Texas North Bourbon Texas women's. Bourbon Women's. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, are there any other events or or things that you have planned for? Uh, yes. So, um, of course, Emma and Hope from uh, Garrison Brothers are uh, the heads of our Bourbon Women Texas chapter, and they realize that Texas is just too big <laughs> for. You know, not everyone in Texas can get down to the Austin area for events. So I approach them um, so that I can start holding events for women up in the Northeast Texas area and their spouses. Um, so yes, I am. The first event I have planned is uh, June 3rd. Um, we'll be meeting at a distillery in Richardson. Um, it'll just be sort of like a meet and greet. Obviously, when Tawakiro gets opened, I'll be holding events um, there as well. Um, Bourbon Women is just kind of a great uh, resource for women in the bourbon industry or interested in bourbon. Um, it's a great networking. Um, and then not everybody in Bourbon Women is in the industry. Some are just women who like to drink bourbon. <laughs> Oh, Shannon, uh, where where in Richardson? What what place in Richardson? Uh, Lockwood Distillery um, in Richardson. So if you uh, connect to the Bourbon Women Texas Facebook or Instagram page, uh, you will see uh, those events kind of get announced. Um, there's the National Bourbon Women. Facebook and Instagram, but then Bourbon Women Texas also has their own social media account. Yeah. And you'll see us posting. Yeah, we'll share the events as well on Probe Skilled. Yeah. Just see those cross listed. Um, yeah, this is so, you know, what Tawakar Tawakaro, I keep saying Caro, but Tawakaro it, is doing. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know I'm not the only one. Um, you know, what they're doing with their stuff, uh, you know, we talked about distilleries that have, you know, a bunch of varietals and um, versus those that have just a few. And I think this really highlights when they focus on a couple of things, they do them very well. And this distillery has done that. The, the malted rye that's not 100% malted rye. They added a couple of other grains in there to really highlight flavors and bring them all together. They've blended the flavors well. They've matured well together. And when we've tried other Texas whiskey um, expressions, you get spikes of flavor here and there. But very rarely do we find them that are blended well together and give you an overall flavor profile that this does. Um, and then when I was talking about the complexity, your first drink versus your second drink versus your third drink, you'll start picking out different flavors. This is one of those glasses, one of those bottles that you can sit down and spend time with. And some of you guys have heard me talk about that. There are some bottles you can just drink. You don't have to think about, right? You get home, it's been a long week. You just want to have a drink. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to spend time with it. You just want to drink. Then there are some that, wow, I can really enjoy this. I can smell it. Wow. Oh, that's beautiful. I just want to sit here and spend time with it and appreciate the flavors, have a drink and appreciate the drink. Um, but I can also have a drink and enjoy it the whole way through. Um, this is, I don't want to say it's unique, but it's, it's really something that I think highlights the craftsmanship that these two brothers have put into their product. Uh, I think this is absolutely something that if you don't have this in your collection yet, 
you absolutely should think about picking up this bottle, um, either one of them, any of them. Um, they are certainly in my collection here, and um, they're, they're a ma uh, mainstay staple in our bar. Um, and it's definitely something we go to. What I really like about it is you can jump to a high proof and you don't give anything up. There's a lot of, of distilleries that you go to a, a cast strength. And if you're not a high proof drinker, wow, it smacks you in the face, you know, punches you right in the face and goes and kicks your mom and, and you want another drink. This doesn't do that. This is one of those that, wow, it's beautiful at, at both levels. And it's something you can enjoy at both levels. Well, and there's something thing to be said about people who really like the rye. Yeah. And with the malted rye, it takes that kick out of it to where you can actually taste the flavor that the Green. rye has has to offer. Yeah. You appreciate the grain. Um, and I like that even at a char four, you're a high char level. That's considered a high char level. We don't get that off the flavor profile. Nobody in any of the tastings pulled out wood flavors. That wasn't something that we heard as a, a tasting note was, oh, I, I taste the char. I taste the tannins. Um, we got beautiful flora was finished in some kind of a, a you know, a, a port or, you know, some kind of a barrel. We didn't get that char tannin smack you in the face. Um, and, and you're still aging it that two year, two and a half year mark that typically we would expect to see that um I, I think it's great you know you know we've been a fan of the product so I don't have to go much further there um what do you guys think what's your what's your overall impression of this well i have to say that i feel a, a kinship there because i grew up in dallas greenville and all my relatives who lived around lake tawakanee but it was Caddo Mills. So that's where the Indians were. My dad was stationed at Caddo Mills. So I feel like I have a kinship there because Lake Tawakani was in my wheelhouse for my whole life. And now it's. You muted yourself. Now it's still care. Uh, I, I love. It's awesome that. Um, now it's tell That now I can see that uh, Tawakaro uh, along with the Tawakani. So that's kind of cool. And I, I kind of joked with the guys in the move uh, from Grapevine to Palestine, um, you know, about that, that Caddo uh, population. So luckily for the guys, um, not far from the distillery in Palestine are some Caddo burial mounds that um, is sort of a, I won't say a national park, but it is a, a a place of interest that people go and visit. Um, so I said, you know, at least y'all picked a place where there was still a large Caddo population at some point. Um, all right, so we're coming up on on the hour. And as you guys know, we always try and, you know, respect everyone's time, respect our, our guests' time. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and stop the recording and we're going to jump into our kind of happy hour event where we uh, hang out. Um, and so now that the recording is stopped,